Chapter 10 covers campaigns and elections. And first, you really need to talk about types of elections. First of all, you have midterm elections that come between a presidential cycle. We're actually about to have one of those this year in 2022. And typically speaking, there is lower turnout in midterm elections than a presidential election year. Whether it's a midterm or a presidential election year, the election in November is actually known as the general election. And before you reach the general election, you often have primary elections in which each party is choosing a candidate for the general election. Now, if each party only has one candidate that stepped up to run for that particular office, then there won't be a primary. But if there are multiple candidates for a particular party, there will be primary elections. You also have a couple of progressive era reforms that are related to elections, one being a referendum. This is actually added to a ballot in which people are given a direct voice in deciding in an up or down vote on a particular law. You could also have a recall election in which a person is forced to go before the voters sooner than they originally would have. So, for example, one of the more recent recall elections was in the state of California. The governor was recalled. So the governor was elected to a four-year term, but within a couple of years was recalled because of displeasure among the people, and that governor was able to stay in office and will run for re-election on the regular schedule despite the recall. So the recall is a special election specifically because people are displeased with a sitting official and are requiring them to run before their term actually expires. A majority system means that a candidate must see, receive a majority of all votes cast in that district. A plurality system is, however, to win a seat in a parliamentary body or any other representative body, a candidate needs only to receive the most votes in the election, not necessarily a majority of votes. The electoral college system in our presidential elections is a plurality system, and a lot of parliamentary democracies in Europe or even our neighbors to the north, Canada, use a plurality system even in their parliamentary bodies. Proportional representation is how those parliamentary bodies often reach their number of representatives from each political party. They give the seats in proportion to the percentage of the total vote. So to use simple numbers, even though there's often hundreds of people involved, if there are five votes in an election and one of the most popular parties wins three of those seats. I will color those three with green X's. A minority party wins one of the remaining seats, and I will highlight one of those in pink. But another minority party actually wins that last seat. And in large systems, like British Parliament, for example, you often have hundreds of seats instead of this example of five, and they're all decided in the same proportional way. So the major party that got three-fifths of the vote, well, in this case, they get three of five. But in a case of hundreds, they could get dozens and dozens of seats. Versus a minority party might only get an individual seat if they only received a tiny little fraction of the vote. The crazy part about that is that sometimes like neo-Nazi candidates can actually hold a seat in a parliamentary body because of that proportional system. A lot of people criticize that if you come from an American perspective where we are used to the two-party system where you have two candidates, up or down vote, majority system. I mentioned a bit ago the Electoral College, and you can see here how the Electoral College makes some states worth more than others. Sparsely populated western states 
are only worth three electoral votes, like Montana, North Dakota, Wyoming, South Dakota. They are only worth three electoral votes because they have one member of the House of Representatives. Their entire state is a congressional district, plus their two senators. Whereas if you look at New York, for example, it is worth 29 electoral votes. Why? Because there are 27 congressional districts, therefore 27 members of the House of Representatives in New York, plus two statewide senators. California, 53 congressional districts. Based on the latest census, both New York and California are actually going to lose some seats. Texas has 36. That's actually going to go up. But you add in their two senators, they are worth 38 electoral votes. Presidential electors from each state meet after the popular election to cast ballots for the president and vice president. Now, in 48 out of the 50 states, there is a winner-take-all system where the statewide winner gets every single one of that state's votes. In Maine and Nebraska, however, Nebraska is right here, and Maine up here, they do what's called the Congressional District Method, where the statewide winner only receives two votes right away, and that represents the two senators from that state. All of the other votes are one by one based on congressional districts. So in Nebraska, there are three congressional districts. So if you're the statewide winner, you immediately get two electoral votes. If you win all three of those congressional districts, then you will get the total of five electoral votes from Nebraska. However, if you only win one of those and your opponent wins two, then it's actually going to be divided. You will, as the statewide winner, get two, plus one, because you won one congressional district. That is a total of three, but your opponent will receive two. So it is more evenly divided. That makes the margin of victory, which you can see in a basic pie chart here, the margin of victory a lot narrower. In recent elections, dating all the way back to 2008, in those recent elections, the electoral margin of victory looked quite large when, in fact, the popular margin of victory, the number of votes, was a lot closer. In particular, 2016 and 2020. In 2016, it looked like President Trump won rather resoundingly when, in fact, it was a razor-thin election. In 2020, it looked like President Biden won rather resoundingly, when in fact it was a razor-thin election. By doing things the congressional district way, you would see closer margins of victory in the Electoral College. But the type of change that would lead to that is probably not very likely, because you have one party that wants to actually eliminate the Electoral College altogether. The Democratic Party really wants an up-or-down popular vote. The Republican Party wants to keep the Electoral College as it currently exists because it's to their advantage to do so. The change to the Congressional District method would make running for president a whole lot more competitive and require you to campaign in many more places, which is not appealing to either party because that makes them have to work harder to run for office. We were just talking about the number of Congressional Districts, and every 10 years you need to have a census to gauge the population of particular regions. Now, when you redistrict, sometimes you have to shrink down. In the case of New York, we are going to lose a seat in Congress. In the case of Texas, they're actually going to gain a couple. So their redrawing of lines is to increase or decrease the number of seats. That's the number one reason you need to redistrict. The problem is, if a particular party controls the state government in that particular state, there can be gerrymandering. You can see a very insanely gerrymandered district here to the right. Very oddly shaped. Why? Because it gives a certain advantage to one political party over another. That is the goal of gerrymandering. Both parties do it. 
There are gerrymandered districts that benefit Republicans in some states when they control that state's government, and there are gerrymandered districts in Democratic states where they are in control of the state government. The coattail effect means that if there's a really popular presidential or governor candidate, that people will vote down the ballot for the remainder of that same party's ticket. And a good example of that is right here in central New York, we live in what's called a swing district. It was long held by a man named Jim Walsh, but when he retired from Congress, a man named Dan Maffei served one term, only to lose in the following election to a woman named Anne Marie Burkle only to come back and win another single term, only to then lose again two years later to our current congressman, John Katko. Now, John Katko actually just announced that he will not seek re-election in the 2022 election cycle. So you could see the same kind of pattern that started up here with Jim Walsh start all over again, where it flips and flops back and forth. Now, part of the reason that this flipping and flopping back and forth happened was because in 2008, the very same election in which Dan Maffei first entered Congress, he was a Democrat running on the same ticket as President Barack Obama, extremely popular. And Marie Burkle was elected in 2010. That was when there was a huge wave of Republican members coming into Congress as a lashback against some of the policy decisions of President Obama and the Democratic Party in general. Two years later, in 2012, President Obama, having rebounded in his popularity, won re-election, and Dan Maffei enjoyed riding his coattails, it's called. Then, in 2014, there was another midterm election in which the Republican Party saw some gains, and John Katko enjoyed those coattails. So depending on the political trend of the time, somebody can enjoy the coattail effect and ride that wave into office. Incumbency simply means that you are the sitting member of government running for re-election. So in 2004, President George W. Bush was running for re-election. He was the incumbent president of the United States. And then in 2012, President Obama was the incumbent president of the United States running for re-election. In these two cases, they were re-elected. When President Trump, first elected in 2016, ran for re-election in 2020, he in fact lost because of his sinking approval ratings. Advertising is often a major part of political campaigning, especially presidential campaigns. And spot advertising is very specifically targeted. And here's an example in 2004 when John Kerry was running against George W. Bush and he was attacked by people he had served with in Vietnam as being a coward, um, hurting himself intentionally so that he wouldn't have to go out into battle. Another example of spot advertising is during the 2012 presidential election when Mitt Romney had made a gaffe during a fundraiser. He was campaigning for president, and he made a remark that was then used against him. He said something about how 47% of people that receive some form of a government benefit are always going to vote for his opposition because they're the one promising those kinds of benefits. And that was used against him in political campaigning after the fact in these spot advertisements. PACs and super PACs are private groups that raise and distribute funds for campaigns. Now, in the Citizens United vs. Federal Election Commission decision, the Supreme Court said that essentially political spending by businesses and unions are protected under the First Amendment in the same way that an individual citizen's political spending is protected. And super PACs sprung up out of this because businesses and corporate entities could 
then spend as much money as they wanted to on political campaigns. So you went from regular PACs to, after this Supreme Court decision, super PACs, spending much larger sums of money. Lastly, how do people really decide how to vote? Well, there's prospective voting that says the promise of the future, what is to come. When President Obama ran for office and his message was hope and change and let's move forward, that was prospective voting. He attracted a lot of voters who were encouraged by his messaging. Retrospective voting is usually more of a judgment of your performance. So have you done a good job or not? And so this joke here, a person holding a sign that says you can't fix stupid, but you can vote them out, that is retrospective. They're saying, hey, not a good job, let's vote them out of office. That is the end of the Chapter 10 lecture. If you have any questions, reach out. Otherwise, I'll see you in class.